Hello and welcome. I'm Valerie Paley, Senior Vice President, Chief Historian, and Director of the Center for Women's History at the New York Historical Society. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Louise Mirror, our President and CEO, Pam Schaffler, Chair of the Board of Trustees, all of our trustees, Joyce B. Cowan, Diane Max, and the late Adam Max, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, along with our Chairman's Council, our members, and our many other generous donors. None of the work of New York Historical is possible without your continued and committed support. As many of you know, we launched the Center for Women's History in early 2017. It is the first initiative of its kind in the nation within the walls of a major museum in the United States. Now, during this challenging time of the COVID-19 pandemic, we remain committed to exploring the lives and legacies of women who have shaped and continue to shape the American experience. Which brings me to today's keynote conversation, writing great women for the public intergenerational storytelling. It is part of the sixth annual Diane and Adam Emacs Conference on Women's History, Breaking News, Breaking Barriers, Women in American Journalism. The format for this year's conference is a little different consisting of a series of conversations and panels, which we will air over the course of our related exhibition, Cover Story, Catherine Graham, CEO. And now, I am delighted to honor and honored to introduce today's panelists. Michelle Duster is an author, professor, public historian, and champion of racial and gender equity. She has written, edited, or contributed to over a dozen books. Her most recent, Ida B. The Queen, The Extraordinary Life and Legacy of Ida B. Wells, was released on January 26th by Atria One Signal Publishers. She co-wrote the popular children's history book, Tate and His Historic Dream, co-edited Impact, Personal Portraits of Activism, Shifts, an, an anthology of women's growth through change, Michelle Obama's Impact on African-American Women and Girls, and edited two books that include the writings of her paternal great-grandmother, Ida B. Wells. She's written articles for Time, Essence, Huff Post, Teen Vogue, People, Glamour, Daily Beast, and the North Star. Michelle has appeared on MSNBC, CNN, WTTW, CBS, and CW, as well as numerous radio shows. Her advocacy has led to street names, monuments, historical markers, and other public history projects that highlight women and African Americans, including Wells. She's working on two children's picture books that will be published by mid-2023, and several public history projects that will feature women trailblazers. Our moderator, Irene Carmone, is a senior correspondent at New York Magazine, a CNN contributor, and co-author of Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which spent three months on the Times bestseller list and inspired the exhibition coming to New York Historical in the fall. She's been a national reporter at MSNBC and NBC News, as well as a staff writer at Salon.com and Jezebel.com, covering gender, reproductive rights, and the law. As a contributing writer to the Washington Post's Outlook section, she won a 2018 Mirror Award from the Newhouse School at Syracuse University for her work breaking the story of sexual harassment allegations against Charlie Rose. She speaks frequently across the country on women's leadership and rights. In 2011, she was one of Forbes 30 under 30 in media. And now welcome, Michelle and Erin. Thank you so much, Valerie. And um, Michelle, I'm so thrilled to be with you this evening. Um, so we happen to be speaking at a moment of great mixed emotions, pain, sadness, relief, um, perhaps disbelief. That's because we're speaking uh, the day after a verdict came down in the trial of Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd. Um, and it's been said again and again that we might not have seen such a verdict were it not for the people who chose to bear witness, including a teenage girl. Um, and this, of course, makes me think a lot of your great grandmother, Ida B. Wells. And so just before we get into this incredible book, and the work that you do and the legacy of it. I wonder if we could just take a moment to, to take temperature, what's on your mind right now, um, as there is some form of closure in one story um, 
and also something made possible by a similar kind of work, if not in a formal journalistic way, to what Ida B. Wells did. Um, what, what's on your mind this afternoon? Well, thank you, Erin, for um, <laughs> hosting me and the uh, New York Historical Society. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, it is an interesting time in our country's history. Um, today in particular, um, you know, I think uh, most people in the country have some kind of reaction um, to the uh, verdict of the Derek Chauvin case. Um, and that as a direct um, relationship to the work that my great grandmother did. Um, she was a um, data journalist. Uh, she's been credited with being a pioneer in data journalism. She used investigative journalism as a form of activism to um, uh, highlight and show and document and chronicle the realities when it came to lynching during her time. Um, she was born during the Civil War. So she came of age during Reconstruction and unfortunately um, lived during a time when there was mob rule was prevalent in this country. Um, so, you know, we are still in 2021 dealing with some of the uh, remnants of, of the type of violence that my great grandmother lived through. And so it, it, when, you, when you heard the news yesterday about the verdict um, and thinking about how much this was you know, dependent on, you mentioned data journalism, you know, I read in your book and in other places about your great grandmother going out and interviewing people and finding out what really happened when there was a lot of misinformation. Um, when there was, for example, there were allegations um, made about the individuals who were lynched that later turned out to be completely false. And we saw something really similar, right, in the George Floyd case where the initial press release uh, made certain claims about what had happened and the video told a completely different story, it showed a story that led to a conviction of murder. Um, do, do you feel like, well, I guess, let me ask you this, what was your reaction to it yesterday? Let me just stop there. Uh, I mean, I definitely felt a sense of relief um, that justice had been served. Um, and, you know, un unfortunately, it's one of the few times um, that, that this has actually occurred, which, um, you know, I, I mean, I have mixed reactions because it's like, you know, I, I don't want people, I'm hoping that um, people don't start with this, you know, um, <laughs> kind of repeat of what I, I felt um, we experienced in 2008 of like, oh, we live in a post-racial society, okay, you know, we've had one victory and so now all problems are solved. And it's like, no, this is the beginning of, um, you know, justice and we've had 400 years of injustice. And so to me, one victory um, is not enough to celebrate um, all of the problems that we still face. And I hope people are cautious um, when it comes to uh, making broad stroke kind of predictions and feeling sense of relief of um, an entire system that still exists. Right, and I mean, I, I think anybody who, who picks up the book can see how, in some ways, how sickening the parallels are. You know, if this were, it, it, you know, although there was a lot of progress made uh, in the sort of ways that the law was written, um, and the public acknowledgement of racism, it is remarkable still how sort of stubborn these problems are if you read about the things that, that Ida B. Wells was documenting and you understand what people are experiencing today with respect to police violence and racism. Um, and, I, and one reason why I wanted to start out talking about this particular moment that we're in, one, obviously because it's incredibly important and two, something that you do in this book, which is that you specifically situate Ida B. Wells' work in the context of contemporary movements and controversies. Um, and and you, you kind of you, you talk about other civil rights leaders that, that followed her, including ones who are living today. You talk about um, Black Lives Matter. You talk about that post-racial um, supposition or myth. And so I'm wondering, you know, you've, you've done a lot of public history around your great grandmother, but this book is different you know, we, we use the word public in the title because I thought, you know, similar to what we were doing with Notorious RBG, did you want to do something different in this book than what we think about uh, when people think a biography of a great woman? And if so, what did you want to do? 
Right, well, um, so when I started working on this book on Ida B. the Queen, there had already been several biographies that written about my great grandmother. And, um, and so the challenge um, for me and the goal was to create something different than what already existed. And so um, telling her story um, in, a, in a sort of sweeping overview um, and connecting her life story and the work that she did to more contemporary people, issues, and organizations, um, I thought would help younger people understand that the, the uh, work that my great grandmother was involved in and the times that she lived in are not ancient history. They are, there's a direct connection between what she was doing um, and what is happening today. And so um, I think it's important for people to understand that the past is connected to the present. And the people that are leaders today are standing on shoulders. And uh, as, as my great grandmother was as well. I mean, we, we all live in the same world. And so when people see those connections, then um, the history makes more sense. Um, and then the people become more relatable, um, especially, like I said, to younger people. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, if, if anybody picks up the book, they can see, for example, beautiful illustrations like this. Um, we also, um, I, I love how, you know, we, we did this in Notorious RBG and it's so important, including primary sources, source documents, so that people really feel like they're moving through her life and her work in a dynamic way, as well as the contemporary implications of it. How did you decide what the visual vocabulary of the book would be and, and what kinds of like documents and stories because you have this huge life with these mega biographies but you're really trying to do something you know to reach the public so what was that process like for you well while i was uh, working on the book um, i was kind of taking notes for myself um, of images that i thought would complement the text um, in a way that would bring the information alive and make it um, so that, like you said, more of a younger generation would see, um, you know, there's, there is something different about hearing about something versus actually seeing a primary document. And so um, I was doing a lot of research um, um, in order to collect the information on the book. Um, the, the fortunate thing for me was that my great grandmother was a writer um, mm -hmm. and she left behind a lot of documents um, it is in pamphlets and newspaper articles. And then she also happened to be surveilled by the FBI. And so I had an opportunity to look at the um, files. Um, I didn't include the, the Thank actual- Thank you, FBI. Report, like, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but I did, um, you know, uh, I mean, in the, you know, the layout of the book, um, it is separate a little bit on um, what the FBI files said. Um, and so I just think it, it sort of makes it more tangible um, and more dynamic to have those kind of documents and images incorporated into the text. Yes, in fact, I think I have it here. Uh, the FBI described Ida B. Wells as, quote, one of the most dangerous Negro agitators. Um, <laughs> obviously an investigative journalist, a civil rights hero, and a dangerous Negro agitator is, uh, is the name of the FBI. But hey, they kept records, so there you go. Um, so, you know, you write in the book about how you had this kind of, um, it sounds to me like a kind of charmed childhood in Chicago of, um, you know, being surrounded by Black history and literature but not too heavily feeling the kind of legacy aspect of it, like not feeling like you were under her shadow per se, but that, and, and you also write about how in the book now, even more so people in uh, contemporary life have started to get really interested in your great grandmother's life, the IDP Wells Society that Nicole Hannah Jones started, uh, people representing her in other platforms. Um, could you talk to me a little bit about how your personal relationship with telling Ida B. Wells' story changed over time, you know, how you became interested in it, and um, what that process was like for you to decide that you wanted to embrace it. Right, well, um, I think people really um, 
it's helpful if people can kind of take a step back from, um, I understand that people are enamored with my great grandmother and they are um, inspired by her and, you know, consider her to be their shiro and their muse and all kinds of ways that they are really drawn to her. Um, and I really believe some of that is because of time. Um, because during my great grandmother's time, while she was alive, she was, as the FBI said, you know, considered a dangerous Negro agitator. Um, some of her contemporaries found her to be extremely difficult. Um, and uh, she, she faced a lot of criticism. Um, she faced alienation and marginalization during her time. And she was considered very controversial um, and to some people quite annoying. <laughs> uh, <because she> was <laughs> A thorn in people's side. She just wouldn't let up, you know, with, yeah. with um, so calling out what she considered to be grave injustices. Um, she was highly critical of uh, political leaders, um, civic leaders. And so um, because she was so controversial during her time, um, shortly after she passed away, I am related to her through my grandmother, her youngest daughter. And um, I always was taught when I was growing up that um, it was it was not easy for um, for my family to sort of publicly celebrate that we were related to Ida B. Wells because she was considered so controversial at oh. the time that she died and during shortly after. And then you have to think about, um, so she died in 1931 and then World War II started in 1941. And so you're dealing with war situations. Um, there's a lot of also civic unrest. And, and so it's not easy at certain times in our social and political history to celebrate um, somebody who is considered to be controversial. But I think with now we're 90 years after she passed away and, um, you know, it, it's wonderful that people are celebrating her. Uh, but also one of my concerns is that um, she's becoming a mythical character character and um, and some of what she did and what she her, her the actual reality of her life is sort of being um, sugarcoated and um, I just want people to be grounded in reality of who she was what she did um, and and just even the experience of growing up learning about her um, we were always taught we must meaning my my siblings and my cousins were to um, be uh, sort of subtle um, ab about our relation to Ida because there was still um, a sense of her being so controversial. And was that, I mean, was, was that kind of ideological? Was it like respectability politics? Uh, you know, what, what were people afraid of in your family if, if you were associated with her? What kind of backlash? I don't know if there's a specific kind of backlash that people mm -hmm. were afraid of. It's just that, um, like I said, my grandmother was Ida's youngest daughter. Mm -hmm. And so she literally grew up with Ida um, as, you know, her, her mother. And um, I, I think when people are um, an actual child of somebody who is um, in the public eye and considered to be so controversial and dangerous. Um, it, it's, a, it's an interesting kind of childhood. And, and I know my grandmother made a conscious decision to not have a public life um, mm -hmm. in sort of reaction to her mother's public life. Um, and, and you'll find this over and over again if you really look at a lot of families where there's a famous um, person, especially if they are in sort of a civil rights kind of um, uh, role, a lot of times the next generation wants the opposite. <laughs> um, right. I mean, and, I, I think it could be hard to be the child of an icon, right? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of competition for your parents' attention. Right. I mean, obviously there's, yeah, I mean, my, my grandmother had to share her mother with the, the world mm -hmm. um, and, um, and the world in some extent came to her um, because my, my, grandmother did tell us about how, you know, their family, her mother and father would host people at the house. There were a lot of people in and out of the house, a lot of um, what we consider to be historical icons today. Um, but, you know, they were uh, my great grandparents' contemporaries. Um, and so, you know, she, my grandmother grew up in a very unusual way um, as the child of um, two civil rights activists. Um, and my great grandmother in particular was even, um, 
globally um, well known. Um, and, you know, so, so every generation um, has its own um, experiences. And my grandmother, I did know my grandmother very well. And she very much focused and um, emphasized for me, and I'm sure all of my cousins and my brothers, for us to have our own identity mm-hmm. and our own sense of accomplishment and not sort of define ourselves by what somebody else's accomplishments were. Um, and, and I really appreciate that um, emphasis to be very clear on who we are as individuals in and of ourselves and mm-hmm. not you know, constantly connect it to somebody else's um, identity. And so knowing that there's that balance between having your own identity and kind of celebrating this aspect of your family history, how then did you decide to make that shift to work on a part of the public history of your great grandmother? What what was that process? Some of it um, were just opportunities that came along. I mean, um, during in the 1980s, um, William Greaves decided to make a film about my great grandmother based on her autobiography, which my grandmother had spent numerous years um, editing and finally got it published in 1970. So that was almost 40 years after her mother died. And I'm convinced that the work that my grandmother, Alfreda, did um, to get her mother's autobiography published is what has launched all of the um, projects and um, information and enthusiasm about my great grandmother because so many projects that I've seen have used the autobiography as the first um, text that that has launched you know the the, um, rest of the other um, projects and so my grandmother in 1970 got the uh, her uh, her mother's autobiography published and then William Greaves used that text in the 1980s to have a documentary film made for PBS And I happened to be in um, film school at the time that film was made. And so I had the opportunity to work on that film. It was my first uh, professional film uh, that I got a chance to work on. And it, um, you know, was, I mean, it was a dual kind of um, um, opportunity for me because I was working on my family history, but also working on a a professional film. And uh, when I worked on that, I got an opportunity to meet a lot of scholars um, and people who uh, were very knowledgeable about um, a lot of details regarding my great grandmother that were more um, in depth than some of the information that I was able to find on my own. Um, you know, it's the difference between being a family member and being a scholar who spends like, you know, years and years digging through archives to, you know, unearth um, information, primary sources. And so I learned a lot about my great grandmother dur- during that experience. Um, and also, I got an opportunity to travel. Um, to Memphis and um, some other places that she had spent part of her life. And that gave me a greater sense. It made her her experience more tangible to me, actually, when I was in the space that she um, navigated in the South. I had never spent any time in the South except for Texas, uh, which is kind of a whole different, uh, you know, kind of experience than Tennessee or Mississippi. Um, And so, yeah, when I saw the Beale Street Baptist Church and I saw, um, you know, some other places that were very connected to Ida's life, um, that's what kind of made me more curious to learn more about her. And um, and I I sort of could imagine in my mind what kind of um, what kind of society she, she lived in and how she needed to navigate it. I mean, reading the book, I'm reminded again of just how much she was doing things that almost no one else was doing at the time, you know, and and you talked about how she was controversial because she was criticizing people on her own side, too. Um, She was criticizing, um, you know, civil rights leaders. She was criticizing uh, feminist suffragist leaders. Um, So, I mean, I'm wondering, you know, where do you think she got that inner strength? I mean, she also started when she was so young. Um, Where did that steeliness or that fearlessness come from now that you've had some time to really think about her life um, through putting together this book and all the work that came before? What do you think made her who she was? 
I mean, I can only guess. <laughs> um, I, I think that, you know, psychologists have spent a lot of time trying to figure out why people are who they are. And actually, I was a psychology major in college. Um, and so, you know, there's a whole discipline to try to figure out, like, how do people's personalities form? Um, and, you know, I can only guess that obviously her parents had a great um, influence on her. Um, she was born in Holly Springs, Mississippi, enslaved in 1862. Um, and fortunately for her, um, she was freed in 1865 at the end of the Civil War. So she was very young. She was only three years old um, when slavery ended. And so she, bit, she pretty much came of age during Reconstruction. And um, her father was a carpenter. Her father, James Wells, was a carpenter. And her mother, Elizabeth, was a, a, a cook. Um, and so she grew up in, in uh, like an urban area. Um, Holly Springs is a, is a town. And, um, and so that I'm sure just growing up in that environment, you know, influenced her. And then um, her father very enthusiastically um, got involved in um, political conversations and meetings, and he took advantage of the right to vote, which became available to formerly enslaved men in 1870, after the 15th Amendment was passed. And so she grew up based on what she wrote about her life, um, she grew up in a, um, in, a, in, a, in a politically and civically engaged family and um, environment. And in fact, she, because she was able to read, which was a, a skill that was new for um, formerly enslaved people because they had not been able to get formally educated during slavery. Um, and so she was around a lot of people who did not know how to read. And so her father asked her to read the newspaper to his friends, um, and which I think gave her um, practice um, reading and speaking in front of groups of people. Um, it gave her practice speaking in front of men. Um, and, and I'm sure it's in some way it had to have shaped her, her confidence level and her um, sensibility when it came to um, you know, taking advantage of different opportunities, um, learning about how political systems worked. Um, and she also saw her father vote um, for a candidate that was the opposite of his former enslaver um, uh, recommendations. And as a result, he was locked out of his carpentry uh, tools and house. And so he ended up just rebuilding. Um, and so, that must have had an effect on Ida as far as seeing that if you um, follow your own, um, you know, sort of convictions and you might actually uh, experience repercussions, but if you, if you believe in them strongly enough then you're willing to just take that loss and, and, and keep, you know, uh, re basically rebuild your life. Um, so those are all of the things that I think had an impact on her. I'm sure there are some other, you know, um, things. She also grew up um, in a very religious family. Um, and so that had to be some kind of guiding post as well, as far as her um, sense of what was right and wrong. You know, having written about Justice Ginsburg, something that jumped out at me, in addition to this kind of childhood of reading and explaining and discussing and seeing the kind of refusal of her father to fall into line was that she lost her parents at a young age. She was 16, I believe, when she lost both of her parents. And Justice Ginsburg was around the same age when she lost her mother, who she was incredibly close to. And uh, I think the function of that was to make her grow up very fast and to make her very kind of steely and self-reliant. Uh, so, what, did you think that that played a role? Obviously, I mean, she, but I think before she before she lost her parents, she obviously had a strong personality mm -hmm. in order for her to be able to take on that role when she was only sixteen. Right. Um, so, whatever happened before she was sixteen gave her the strength mm -hmm. and the, the uh, focus and the determination to be able to take on that level of responsibility of taking care of five um, of her younger siblings. She was the oldest of eight um, and um, two of her siblings unfortunately passed away in childhood. Um, so that left six of them. And so Ida, as the oldest of the, of the remaining six, um, decided at the age of 16 
to take on that adult responsibility. So there's something that happened before she was 16 that gave her the wherewithal and the tool set, um, both mentally and um, skillful, you know, because she had the skills to um, get a job as a teacher. So uh, her parents obviously did a really good job <laughs> uh, of raising Yeah, and her. I don't mean to suggest it was the only thing. It was just a kind of parallel that struck me that contributed perhaps um, and of course, that's the kind of setback that can also take someone completely off of their path. But for her, you know, to, to imagine, it, it seems like from your book also, she had to fight really hard for as long as she could to keep her siblings together with her essentially becoming a head of household, which was much more than what RBG ex experienced. Um, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna like belabor the comparisons too much, but since I also wrote a popular biography, I can't help but think about another um, parallel that you and I were talking about before, and you also wrote a great piece in People Magazine about this, uh, the parallels between, what you wrote about were the parallels between your great-grandfather and great-grandmother's marriage and that of Kamala Harris and Doug Emhoff. Uh, and I would add to that list, RBG and Marty, um, marriages in which uh, a true partnership was at least modeled to the public still something really rare in public life uh, where a woman's aspirations and fight and uh, just you know work is uh, supported by her spouse um, you know in a way that we're so used to seeing women support men I'm, I'm interested um, what it was like for you to to see that and how you wanted to represent that uh, that marriage um, between your great grandfather and your great grandmother and how and could you tell us a little bit about how he supported her? Right. Well, one thing um, that that those the three men that you mentioned have in common is they were all attorneys, right? <laughs> Almost all. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, there's something to that, right? <laughs> um, no, so I, I don't think all lawyers, but definitely all of them were lawyers. <laughs> Right, they all three were lawyers, yeah. So yeah. my great grandfather, Ferdinand Barnett, was an attorney. Um, he had his own law firm, and he also um, was a, a newspaper owner as well. Um, so he and my great grandmother had a lot in common as far as um, sort of social justice um, and civil rights activism. And um, so, so yeah, I mean, they they had, from what I understand, um, a very sort of partnership between them, um, an equal partnership um, between them where they worked together. Um, they, they originally um, worked together on the, the, um, on the pamphlet, the reason why the Colored American is not in the World's Columbian Exposition, which was distributed at the World's Fair in 1893 in Chicago. Um, they both were contributors to the pamphlet as well as Frederick Douglass and Irvine Garland Penn. Um, and my great grandmother was the editor of that pamphlet as well as um, she's the one who raised all the funds to get it published. Um, so from, from everything that I've been able to put together, that is when they met, when they were working on this pamphlet. Um, and Frederick Douglass is the one who invited both of them to participate. So in our family, we credit Frederick Douglass uh, for introducing our great grandparents. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It is amazing um, to have, you know, wow. He has had many roles, but matchmaker is also a, a, an unsung role of Frederick Douglass. Yeah, yeah, because he knew both of them and um, invited both of them to participate in the pamphlet. And so, um, you know, I, while they were working together on the pamphlet, they um, must have uh, found fair, a lot of things in common. And actually, um, Ida was she was not living specifically in Chicago at the time. She was in New York and she had come to Chicago to work on the, the pamphlet, I guess, with all intention of going back to New York. Um, and so while she was here, she worked with Ferdinand on his newspaper on the conservatory because she was here for a few months. So they worked on two projects um, together and ultimately they got married in 1895, two years later, after she, you know, was like, ah, I think I need to go to England for a while and do a speaking yeah, tour. Yeah, this is what I was pulling oh, up yeah, in this, that you said she postponed the wedding three times in order to keep up with her rigorous anti-lynching speaking schedule. Wow. Right, right. And uh, yeah, and she traveled 
overseas for months um, um, in between when they met and when they got married. So um, he was patient. <laughs> Um, in addition to obviously being very smart and very ambitious um, and very accomplished, he was also patient um, and determined and focused on um, her. And so that's one thing that was always um, inspiring to me growing up. I knew that my, uh, I, I always knew that my great grandmother had a very strong personality, that she was very, um, I always learned that she was very opinionated and she was, um, very um, focused and determined and some people called her difficult and, uh, and she was uncompromising, opinionated, like all of these types of, of things that some people view, view as negative for women in particular. Um, but he was attracted to all of, all of who she was. And um, so for me, uh, growing up in this family, knowing that was how she was regarded and that he found that attractive, always made me feel like, well, that's a good thing for women to be that way. Mm -hmm. um, and always- or you don't have to change like who you are. Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, the fact that um, he, they're, they're, they had a very egalitarian marriage where he did almost all the cooking. Um, <laughs> also like Marty that. and Ruth. Just like Marty, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I guess he enjoyed cooking. She hated cooking. Um, and so that was a good match. Um, and uh, she, you know, had to travel and he did not try to stop her. Um, in fact, he provided support, like um, nurses to travel with her. And um, when she couldn't travel with the kids, he, the kids stayed with him and she went, you know, so they just really had a good partnership. Yeah. And I mean, you wrote about this in, in your People article, but I think you, you know what seeing and understanding that relationships like that are possible does for people. And now, I mean, I just know that in all of the conversations that I've had with folks about Notorious RBG, they're so interested in the Marty and Ruth love story because it was a partnership and it was a love story. Um, because I think you know we, there is this dominant message that we're told that um, marriage is still something in which the woman sacrifices her aspirations and public work or has to change herself to fit a certain mold or I mean that that a man would be threatened by these kinds of this kind of work as opposed to wanting somebody for who they were um and so I, to me I'm sort of like you know I think Doug Emhoff, Marty Ginsburg, and Ferdinand <laughs> Barnett um all clearly shared that they were not insecure in their own abilities right that they're like really strong in themselves and they see themselves as being kind of um, enhanced by having a partner who is so exceptional rather than uh, diminished by um, so so that that is very cool so so you and I were talking about how um, you wrote a book about someone who yes is a member of your family but somebody that you never met um, so I, I'm wondering, you know, as we close our conversation, sadly, I feel like I could keep talking to you for so long. Um, <laughs> what, what, what was hard about doing this? What do you think you learned from the process about yourself too? Well, what was challenging about writing the book is that is the lack of, of information about certain, you know, things um, that I will never be able to find out. Um, because, you know, if, if my great grandmother didn't write about it, um, and my grandmother never told me about it, then there's really no way to find that information. And so, you know, there's some things that will just stay with them in their graves. Um, you know, I wanted to know uh, more personal kind of things like, like, where was their first date, you know, <laughs> uh, when my great grandparents met, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. Like, I mean, I, I will never know, you know, um, where did they go for a walk or, you know, did they go to dinner or what did they do, you know, for their first date? And, um, you know, uh, I wanted to know um, just some more personal things like, uh, you know, what, what, I know that, I mean, I read about their, their wedding, the actual wedding day, um, but I wanted to know more information about, um, you know, what was at the reception, what kind of food, <laughs> you know, those type of details. Was Frederick um, Douglass at the wedding? Yes, excuse me? Was Frederick Douglass at the wedding? No, Frederick Douglass actually <laughs> had passed away um, oh. shortly before, before the wedding, a few months before the wedding. So um, that much you yeah. know, unfortunately. 
Right, right. I mean, Frederick Douglass, uh, for my great grandmother, was um, uh, he was her mentor, and um, I'm not sure if she looked at him as a father or a grandfather figure, but he was about 45 years older than her. Mm -hmm. um, and after he passed, he passed when she was in um, California, and so she was not able to go to the funeral, which was in Maryland. But um, so she wrote about that in her autobiography about how so much she was upset that she wouldn't be able to be there. Um, but, but then she ended up, she and Ferdinand ended up getting married in June of that same year, just a few months after Frederick Douglass passed away. So, um, no, he was not able to be at the wedding, <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm sure they, they probably paid tribute to him in some ways since he was instrumental in them meeting. Um, but yeah, I just, you know, there are certain things, um, that are more out of the public eye uh kind of information that like i would love to know like what did my great grandmother do to relax <laughs> i mean she didn't she do was, a lot of relaxing i know but she had to you have to recharge you mm -hmm. know i mean did she listen to music or did she i know she was an avid reader i mean that was mm -hmm. very clear um she wrote about that about herself but but she you you can't you have to everybody has to relax even if it's for five minutes um, right. so you know things like that like my, my grandmother did it right about how she would brush her mother's hair so maybe that was relaxing for her mm -hmm. doing her own hair you talk about how she had natural hair um so so in closing you know tell me about what this process taught you if it changed you at all or, or how you're thinking about it now that, that this particular project is done well um as far as how i've changed um I, I think just working on the book helped me realize how much um, how much I can do because uh, I was working on the book while I was also still working. Um, so it was kind of like I had two jobs, and so um, I uh, I was I was juggling a lot. But um, it was it was um, interesting, you know, just kind of going down this path of trying to put together the pieces of my great grandmother's life in a way that made it a little more personal um, for the readers. And also just trying to um, kind of see the connection between the lessons that were passed down in my in my family um, and how who, part of who I am is I'm sure connected to who my great grandmother was in ways that I would never, you know, really didn't think that deeply about it. Um, you know, so I guess it kind of made me examine where some of my attitudes about things come from or some of my opinions or even approaches um, to life um, have, have been passed down through the generations. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly the way that she was spreading her message and her work in so many different spheres and the way you are too and, and working on children's picture book and again, Ida be the queen um, and, and the public history work that you've done until now, certainly it seems like in your own very personal way, you were following in her footsteps. Um, so Michelle, thank you so much for your time and this wonderful conversation. I encourage everyone to pick up Ida be the queen, uh, this popular biography of Ida B. Wells, an extraordinary woman chronicled in an extraordinary way. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> thank you, Erin. Thank you. I want to thank Irene Carmone and Michelle Duster for being with us today. Our Max Conference series, Breaking News, Breaking Barriers, Women in American Journalism will continue throughout Women's History Month and beyond. Please sign up for our mailing list and follow us at nyhistory.org to get the latest on the series. And finally, we hope to see you in person on Central Park West to view cover story, Catherine Graham, CEO, opening on May 21st, in our Joyce B. Cowan Women's History Gallery. Until then, stay safe and see you again soon.